Hello and welcome to this Archer virtual tutorial. This is the second virtual tutorial on version control. In part one I gave a general introduction to version control. So I talked about why you might want to use a version control system and what benefits these tools offer. Then I gave um, an overview of the common features and common concepts and common terms um, for many version control systems. Now in part two in this presentation I want to focus on some of the differences between different version control systems. In particular I want to describe uh, a major distinction in two different models of version control, namely centralized version control and distributed version control. Uh, as we'll see, centralized version control um, is used by tools such as CVS and SVN, Subversion. Distributed version control is used by tools like Git and Mercurial. So I will go on to describe the key features of these two different models, their um, advantages and disadvantages. Then I'll give some examples of um, useful version control workflows. Um, finally, I'll, I will give some insight into um, uh, hosting of repositories and additional features that some um, repository hosting and management websites and uh, management systems offer. And finally, I'll give a couple of tips about uh, for you to, to decide um, what version control system you would like to use. So, um, yes, so, so starting with centralized version control, uh, which is also known as client server version control, um, the examples of version control systems that use this model are CVS, Subversion, and uh, Perforce. So, so CVS and Subversion are both open, so open source. Perforce is a, um, is a commercial uh, system. So, as I said, uh, um, CVS and SVN are both examples of centralized version control systems. So the essential um, model for, version, for centralized version control is that you have um, a single repository which lives uh, on a central server, so a server which is accessible to all those who want to use it. Each user um, of the repository has a working copy. So um, each, um, each person who wants to, to access the information in the repository and wants to uh, commit changes to the repository has checked out some stage a working copy. So if you're a new user, you check out a fresh working copy. So if you're Carol or Dave and you're just starting uh, with this project, um, you check out whatever, whatever the current um, uh, state of the most recent uh, revision is in the repository, which in this case is a revision 1, 2, 3. Then um, as you uh, do some, make some changes to, if, for example, source code and then the repository and the working copy, you make changes, so users make changes locally in their working copy. So for example, Alice and Bob both made changes. Um, so they started off, they were at revision one, two, three, and they've, they've each made some changes. Now let's say they both want to commit these changes. So Alice commits these changes to the repository, which updates the repository revision to revision 124. So the point about the way these centralized version control models work is that now that Bob wants to commit, he's just a split second later than Alice um, to try and commit his changes um, on top of revision 123, um, but he's, he's, he's not allowed. So the first one to commit wins in a sense because the first person to commit, uh, their changes are recorded in the repository. The person who uh, say loses um, is, is told that they first need to 
update their working copy, which means they need to take the most recent commit, revision 124, take that into their working copy, let the version control tool try and merge that, and they have to resolve any conflicts that may arise before they are then allowed to make a commit of their changes. So there's potentially conflict between revision, between Bob's changes to revision 123 and uh, Alice's commit revision 124. Once Bob has resolved those changes, he can commit recording revision 125 in the repository. And um, all the users uh, can update their working copy to, um, to grab this latest um, revision. So this is the basic model. Uh, this is the basic, basic idea, basic workflow uh, for the centralized virtual control model. Um, so uh, users periodically synchronize their working copies by updating it with the latest content, the latest commits in the repository. Um, and they're forced to do so if they want to um, if they want to commit. So, what are some of the key features of centralized version control? Well, there's a centralized workflow. This workflow is, to some extent, enforced. The way that um, provisions are tracked in the repository, at least for for a given well, for a given branch, are that uh, there's a there's a sort of a global view of linear progress, of incremental revision numbers. You can create branches, of course. Commits within these branches um, will, however, also um, um, continue uh, this incremental um, revision number. So there's a global view. You need to be online to commit any changes. So you always need to be online to do any work well. You can do work away uh, if you're not connected. Uh, in the past, I guess, this was um, perhaps a bigger issue than it is now with persistent productivity, but still. still. Crucially, uh, no revision history is stored locally. So all you have locally is your working copy. Um, you need to be online and connect and communicate to the server every time that you want to check the log. So every time you want to see what the past commits were, Anytime you want to check out any past committed versions of files, anytime you want to uh, do some kind of investigation of the um, um, of the, uh, the content of the revisions of the revision history, you have to communicate with the server. So that, of course, uh, requires you to be online, and also just simply takes time. This communication overhead, latency, etc. Another thing, another feature of centralized version control is that uh, because the, there's, there's one single repository where everything is stored on the server, uh, and this is visible by everyone, it means that anything that you commit is visible by all the users who have access to that repository. Uh, this can uh, discourage committing. Because if you're if you're doing some, some work that you know, you're going for some for whatever reason, um, you may not like, uh, I mean, a lot of people intuitively don't want this to just uh, be lying around for everybody to have a look at. So this, this is, you know, nothing about the technology, really. It's purely a social or psychological <laughs> aspect of um, um, collaborative work, um, which means that the way the systems workflow is set up and the, the enforcement, uh, the enforcing of these, of these remote uh, commits to the repository, um, means that they can end up discouraging people who are actually using the tool uh, to experiment with, to experiment with, you know, to record experimental work. It can also discourage you from creating many branches. So um, in principle, you can, you can create as many branches uh, to some extent as, as you like. Um, how efficient that is depends on the implementation, and some tools are more or less efficient. But uh, so even though technology uh, the technology allows you to do it. Again, there are uh, social or psychological reasons why you might not want to. Because effectively, if you, if everybody were to create um, 
five or six um, branches in the repository and you have maybe five or maybe a dozen or maybe two dozen uh, contributors to this repository, and things can start to look quite messy. Uh, and this is almost purely a cognitive thing. It's, it's nothing to do with the technology, but it's more about how, <laughs> how, how, how this is perceived by humans. So this, this can also uh, discourage you from, so the fact that you do not want to, to pollute the repository uh, with, with, your, with your junk branches that are not worthy of being you know, recorded in the central repository means that you can be discouraged from using this tool um, to its full potential. Other issues with centralized version control, as I mentioned before, is that uh, you have to communicate with the server, uh, which costs time. And also, uh, the server is, is effectively, if you think about it, it's a single point of failure. So if the server is down for um, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever the case may be, that downtime means that anybody who's, whose work depends on being able to make commits um, is affected. And you, first of all, you, have to, okay, you also have to set up the server, which, which requires some, can require some system administration tasks. You have to maintain it, so you have to maybe patch it, make sure that software is up to date, make sure that um, um, security patches are applied. You also have to take think about backups, because um, if, if you only have one single copy of the repository on the server, that uh, if it's not backed up, that's um, a bit risky. Um, I think everyone's work uh, in one single place. Right, so let's look in contrast at distributed version control. So examples of distributed version control systems are um, like Git and Mercurial. So these are also known um, as peer-to-peer -peer version control systems for reasons that you'll see. So in distributed version control, each user um, has their own repository stored locally. You do not need a central server. It can be convenient, as we'll see later, to have a central server, but in principle, you don't need it. And the reason for that is because, as opposed to centralized version control, where all you had was the, was the, the latest copies of files that you were working on, you have the entire repository stored locally. So if you're a new user, um, you don't yet have anything on, on, on your machine, um, you will clone, i.e. take a copy of an existing repository. Now, when I say an existing repository, it mean, I mean any re existing repository, because um, if you are Carol, for example, you're just starting out in this, in this project which involves um, four collaborators, and you want a copy of, well, uh, whatever is uh, being worked on, you need to get a copy from someone, and you could get a copy from Alice. And Dave then joins afterwards, uh, is perhaps in the same office as Carol, and will easily get a copy of Carol. So Carol and Dave can both make changes in their working copy. So they, still, so they have, they have, I said they have their repository, they also have a working copy. So they have, they have the repository, which is the entire history uh, of everything. And they've got the working copy of the files that they're currently working on. And when they make changes, and when they commit these changes, these commits are made locally to their local repository. So this means, um, of course, that repositories kept by different people um, diverge. So although uh, Carol and Dave both started out with Alice's copy of the repository, which, by the way, might already be different from Bob's, they immediately made their own changes. So now we have actually three or actually four different uh, repositories. So you might think, okay, is this a good idea? Because we've sacrificed, by sacrificing this one central repository, we've seemed to have gained um, a lot of, um, well, we somehow need to combine the content from different repositories. Because at some point, so the reason why we're doing all this work is, is um, 
working jointly on, on, on something, on some piece of software, for example. Um, at some point, we will want to combine the content from these different repositories. So uh, that clearly that will be uh, we've just shifted a problem of merging these 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 changes that different people have made from occurring in the central repository to at some stage happening somewhere else. And the place where it happens is uh, in inside someone's working copy. Somebody is going to have to um, uh, actually tell the version control tool to merge different versions, the changes from different people. Um, so what they have to do is they have to fetch these changes. So they have to get the um, they have to get Carol's copy of the repository. They have to get Dave's copy of the repository. And they have to um, ingest this into their own working copy uh, and then perform whatever merging is required. Um, and then when they commit, so um, yeah, so Alice, make, Alice makes these merges. She maybe has to make some difficult decisions. She might have to, she might have to talk to Carol and Dave. Um, and then after she's made these, these merge decisions, she commits these changes, again, to her local repository. So now she has uh, the combined content. If Carol and Dave want that as well, they, they have, of course, have to fetch it from her. So all this toing and froing seems maybe a bit wasteful, but the distributed um, nature of this of, 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 the, of the repositories actually buys you a lot of flexibility, um, as we shall see. So one question is uh, to do with the fact that we have these different repositories. So how does the version control system know um, how to merge content from different repositories? The reason I'm asking that is because when it has to emerge, it has to somehow determine how far back to go in the revision history of, for example, two branches if it's trying to merge the content of two branches. How far back it has to go in, in those two branches until it finds a common ancestor. Because from the common ancestor, so that is to say a version that is the same in both branches, uh, from that point it can um, um, combine the changes and, um, and, and, and do a merge. So because we have forfeited our single uh, canonical repository, we don't have this global view that I mentioned earlier. So we don't have um, a simple incrementing revision number which says this commit comes after that, comes after that, comes after that. Which could, of course, be used, uh, this use, to judge when, um, when commits diverge. So how can we solve this? Well, one solution. Um, which was taken up um, by uh, the developers of, of Git, um, and it's also used by Mercurial, I don't know who was first, probably Git, is um, to co compute uh, a unique ID, i.e. a key value, for each commit. Or even better, to compute a, an ID that doesn't just uniquely identify um, the changes, that compose each commit, but also, actually, all the preceding changes, so the entire revision history preceding that commit. So the way that you can do this is, or the way that Git and Mercurial do this, is by using a hash function to generate a 40-digit um, hexadecimal. So essentially what they do is, um, uh, at each commit, they compute this ID based not only on the commit itself, but also um, on, the, on the past. It's a lot of technical detail that I'm sweeping under the carpet, but the point is that once you have these, uh, these unique keys associated with each commit, then if two commits come from different repos and they have the same ID, then you can be guaranteed that they have identical revision histories. Not only are they themselves identical, they also have identical revision histories. And hence, they are common ancestors. So what that allows you to do is, for example, um, so here we see a sequence of commits on Carol's branch and the sequence of commits on Dave's branch. 
Now these, um, these key values that you see here are the, the first few digits of the four few digit um, hash. Now you see that the first three hashes are the same for Dave and Carol. So clearly these are common ancestors. Now the latest common ancestor is this one, K1GA6814. So what the version control tool can, can do, what Git or Mercurial can do, is say, okay, from here I have to start the merge. So this is so so this um, computing these IDs, these, these hash ID, the hash numbers, uh, which seem really cryptic, um, are actually a solution for somehow not losing track of um, shared revision histories between repositories that have common origin. This is a crucial thing which allows these, these uh, distributed version control tools to, to, to work. It'll actually work quite well. So um, I said that a server, having a, having a central server was uh, optional it can um, certainly be convenient. So just replicating the initial the steps that I just explained earlier about uh, how you, the, the, the workflow that you would use, it, um, if you did have a central server, then uh, both Carol and Dave, instead of taking uh, Alice's copy, they could take, a, they could clone the repository on the server. So this is really, in a sense, it's, it's replicating um, the centralized workflow, but now in the distributed context. So as we'll see later, the point is that the distributed version control systems allow you uh, to do this, to, to, to allow you to use centralized, um, the centralized workflow, but they don't force you to. So Carol and Dave again make changes. They commit these changes to their own um, repositories. And then they, um, they push these changes into uh, separate branches in the server repository. So I didn't actually mention branches in the, in the first instance when I talked about Alice ingesting the changes from Carol and Dave. But, but as we see, branches are extremely important in, um, in distributed version control um, systems. They tend to play a, a more important role than in um, centralized version control systems. Because essentially, they become um, the mechanisms for um, allowing repositories to communicate. So, in the initial, in the first case, where we were, where Alice was ingesting the changes from Carol and Dave, what she would do, is she would fetch, uh, or Carol and Dave would push, the changes that they have onto separate branches in her repository. She would then perform a merge and commit the result wherever she saw fit. Now in the centralized case, Carol and Dave are pushing their changes into separate branches in the, in the repository on the server. Now the server itself uh, is not going to do the merge. Uh, nobody's going to log in and, um, and perform the merge there. That's actually discouraged. Um, so typically, if you, have a set, if you have a central repository in the distributed version control context, you would leave it as a, as, a, as a bare repository, which just means that um, you, you have an empty working copy. You don't make any changes to files there. You just consider it to be uh, an archive, a curated archival function. So the point is, is that after you've done this step of Carol and Dave pushing their changes into separate branches in the server repository, the next step is uh, for perhaps again Alice to fetch those, those changes, to fetch those branches from the server repository, Put it into hers. Do the merge. Uh, yeah, and do the merge as before. Actually, uh, essentially. So once she's done the merge, she can commit locally in her own repository. And she can, if she wants, push this back to the server, um, wherever, whatever branch she sees fit, uh, and and therefore the 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 repository on the server is. Um, playing, again, a similar role uh, of, of synchronizing changes. So what are some of the key features of distributed version control? So keep in mind um, how these contrast 
with the key features of centralized version control. Well, you don't need to be online to commit changes. Your repository is just located on your machine. Um, so uh, you can uh, commit changes um, pro uh, locally on your own machine, on your own laptop, or whatever it is, um, which, also mean, which also means that um, these are private. So they don't get committed to a repository that everybody can see on the server. So therefore, you don't have these issues of uh, people perhaps being hesitant to um, commit experimental or tentative work. It also means that you can um, encourage branching. Um, so you can commit early on, which is good. You're encouraging both committing early on and, 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 and um, uh, committing branches, creating and committing branches. The, uh, because you have the repository locally, you have the full revision history uh, locally. So if you want to look at the log, if you want to check out any past versions, anything like that, if you want to do complex operations on, on any uh, past versions, it's all there. You don't have to communicate with the server. Actually, what that does is it's not only convenient, it's also uh, very fast. So um, another thing that, that distributed version control allows you to do is to adopt workflows that are uh, different from the centralized um, uh, model. So in the centralized model, you're forced to work in a centralized way. In the distributed model, you can work in a centralized way. You can also work in other ways, as we'll see. Uh, many common operations that you do, uh, especially all, kind, all kinds of operations, are, are simply faster um, using the distributed version control system because you don't need to communicate with the server. Of course, you, if you don't have a server, you also need to set it up and maintain it. There's no single point of failure. Um, also, when it comes to backups, uh, you, you um, uh, barring some, some, some latest um, changes, you essentially have uh, as many backups of the repository as you have users who have cloned um, that same uh, repository. Of course, how far back they cloned it and how, um, how, how um, recently they have synchronized with other uh, copies. What each, what each copy or each clone contains uh, determines whether, you know, how much of your data you actually have. But, but uh, really, it it's almost gets you, you're almost automatically backing up things. Um, in fact, the creator of, uh, <laughs> the creator of Git, uh, Linus Torvalds, who um, was created uh, Linux, the Linux kernel, he said that his, his backup strategy is he doesn't have one. He just um, puts up um, his repository and lots of people clone it. So, so he knows that it's, uh, he knows he can always get it, back, get it back somewhere off of someone. Uh, now, what these hash IDs that I mentioned earlier allow you to do is they also actually um, allow exact verification of the integrity of data. So because they are um, uniquely computed on the basis of uh, the contents of the commit and the past revision history, what that means is that if you have a record of, um, the, uh, of the hash, um, then you know if you, if you get a repository where that hash is present, then you have that exact same data. Of course, if you've lost the, the hash, you don't know what it is, you can just cross-check if you have multiple uh, clones, you can look at whether the hash is the same, and if so, it's probably the right one, and then you guarantee that it's your original content. So as I said, branches play a very important role in distributed version control systems. They're used to, um, in a sense, communicate between repositories. So they're used for uh, pushing changes from uh, one repository to another and for pulling um, changes from, from another repository. Also, um, and this is, um, not necessarily a direct result of, of the uh, Mercurial and Git being distributed version control systems, but uh, just simply that they've been uh, cleverly designed and, and especially Git um, has very efficient implementations of, um, of, of branching and, and merging. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool. So um, now that we have an idea of the most important difference between uh, version control tools, namely decentralized versus distributed. Um, there are some additional things that are worth knowing about. One of them is, um, so, so, I mean, so hosting additional features. So um, over the past kind of 
kind of eight years or so, um, distributed virtual control systems have become very popular. They've really taken the software development community by storm. Um, Git was was created, started being was initially created in 2005, and probably only started to gain traction maybe around I don't know 2006 2007. Um, so part of the reason why these tools like uh, Git and Mercurial have become popular is it's not just that they allow you, of course, to um, the flexibility as I described before um, of having different workflows and of committing locally, but also that there's a number of websites. Um, um, especially GitHub is a very well-known one, which have uh, helped facilitate uh, the exploitation of, of the potential of these, of these tools um, by providing additional features, as you'll see. So GitHub, uh, for example, offers public hosting of repositories. It offers management of repositories. Um, so it stre really streamlines uh, the um, cloning um, duplication and sharing of um, um, repositories and, and collaborative software development. So how? Well, some of these additional features are um, so mechanisms surrounding so mechanisms that technical mechanisms that facilitate um, kind of social dynamics that need to work to get code to, to get collaborative code development working. Um, for, and, and also that includes um, uh, aspects of, of software project management, etc. So, the, for example, one of these one of these mechanisms is a, is a, is a wiki um, or some kind of issue tracker. Um, that is to say, um, anybody uh, can can um, can log uh, issues, i.e., problems, errors, bugs that need to be fixed. In, a, in the software is stored in a repository, or perhaps um, uh, request features, etc. And these, these these are tracked, and um, the, this they are tracked in such a way uh, that they're that they're tightly integrated with the virtual control workflow. So what that means is that um, you can see not only what communications took place between different contributors to a software development project, but you can also see that actual code that's been developed to uh, fix these bugs or to implement these features, you can see um, uh, when they have been committed. Um, so it's also sort of integrated workflow. Another mechanism is a uh, so-called pool request. So this is just, um, well, the whole, the whole idea is basically that um, if somebody has a repository with software and they put it um, on this website on GitHub and it's public and it's open, um, then anybody can essentially Take a copy of the repository, and and start working with it, and committing, and making changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they don't. It's it's very open and free. It really it really uh, plays into um, especially into open source software development, because as opposed to centralized virtual control systems where you would need to give somebody explicit access to access a, access a server, and if they you had to trust them to um, you know to allow to allow them to actually make changes to this to the single repository, which which you know, you really actually want to contain uh, the canonical version of your of your code, uh, which is quite an ask. Uh, requires a lot of trust. You wouldn't just allow anybody to do that. Instead of that, anybody can just can just go off, take a copy of the repository, and work on it by themselves without in any way affecting um, the parent repository. So GitHub and sites like it make this um, easy to do. They they, they really um, uh, streamline it. So what you can do is you can you can make a you can make a copy, um, which is known as a fork, make changes, and then if you think those changes that you've made should be perhaps integrated into the original repository, you can make what's called a pull request. So that's simply a suggestion to the um, author or authors uh, or managers um, of the original repository to integrate these changes into the parent repository. And what you're literally saying is here's a here's a button to here's a button for you to push. If you want to actually do this, um, so if you agree, uh, if, you, if you can have a look using the virtual control tool, using Git or Mercurial, you can have a look at what the actual changes were in the code. And if you're happy that you want to include them in your parent repository, you can click yes, and that just does it. 
So it's these kind of features which are, which are part of it, um, sites like GitHub are popular. You can also um, obtain um, sort of web-based repository management frameworks like this um, to install yourself uh, or to get somebody at your institution to install. Uh, one example is, is GitLab. So you don't need to rely on these, on these, um, on these public websites. So, I mean, you, GitHub, for example, offers free public hosting. Uh, if you want your repository to be private, you have to pay. So that's that's kind of the business, business model. So I said I would describe some distributed workflows. Um, so here's here's one example, and these are taken from a um, very useful book um, about um, essentially about Git. It's reproduced under a Creative Commons license. So the model here is that. Um, it's in, it's in some sense mimicking the fact that you have a canonical repository. So this is the, the blessed repository, which um, is take, is, is, is um, con which contains the um, I guess the, 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 the approved version of the software. You have a person or people uh, that are the integration managers, which essentially are um, in control of of, of blessing, so they they can they're in control of blessing things. So say say that they have blessed some changes and they've incorporated these approved changes, I should say maybe, into the uh, blessed repository. Now there are some potential contributors, some developers, uh, who think that they can uh, help out. So what they do is they pool the latest versions of of the approved repository into their own private repositories. They develop, 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 they make some changes. Then they push into a public uh, facing side of the repository or a public repository. So for example, their private repository could be located on their on their laptops. Their public repository could be um, located on, the, on GitHub, for example. Then they can issue um, pool requests to the integration manager saying, okay, do you want to accept these changes? Do you want to approve or bless these changes? And if the integration manager agrees, then he says, okay, yes, that looks good. I'll, int I'll integrate that into the um, approved repository. So that's one workflow. Another one is the, um, also known as the, the, the benevolent dictator workflow, or the dictator and lieutenant workflow. I think this is um, apparently named after a workflow um, used um, by Linus Torvalds himself uh, for maintaining the Linux kernel. So again, you have a number of um, public developers. Uh, these developers pull the most recent version of the uh, of the Linux kernel into their own private repository, into what? Into the public repositories, perhaps. Um, they um, make changes, which they, they then, um, so instead of having a single integration manager, we essentially have two layers here. We have lieutenants and a dictator. So this is like a network of trust. So these lieutenants might be uh, you know, quite experienced programmers who are experts on specific sub uh, areas. Various developers will issue pull requests to them. For example, these two developers, first two, are issuing a pull request to the first lieutenant. That lieutenant might um, accept one of the other, or accept both, and, and, and merge them into, into his uh, repository. And now the dictator, benevolent dictator, has a, num has a small number of trusted lieutenants. So, for example, this lieutenant is a, is a trusted lieutenant, a trusted expert on, on networking. So, um, if, this, if this lieutenant thinks that the, um, um, so this lieutenant basically decides what the networking changes, what the changes to the networking aspect of the code should be. So he does a, he issues a pull request to the dictator, and the dictator trusts him, so he accepts that. Similarly, the other lieutenant might be an expert in something else. Finally, the dictator um, merges, uh, well, does it, however, however it's done, doesn't really matter, merges into the, into the uh, approved repository, or the phenomenal repository. So these are just two examples, but the point is that with these distributed systems, you can uh, mimic, well, you have much more flexibility um, in terms of your workflows, and you can mimic perhaps much more um, some natural sort of social dynamics uh, about how we work. So networks of trust. This is one of the one of the things that you can, you can instead of having to say, 
very having, and instead of having to make a very binary decision, yes, no, yes, you can have access to the centralized repository, no, you cannot have access to the centralized repository. In other words, yes, you can commit to the centralized repository, no, you cannot. You can have this more gradated, uh, graduated um, trust network. I guess this is actually useful on very large codes. So just getting to the end, um, and perhaps this is really what you want to know. Uh, tell me, so tell me which version control system should I use? Uh, unfortunately, there's, there really isn't an easy, easy answer. Um, just some ideas. If you are joining an existing project, you probably just use whatever is being used currently, unless, of course, there are huge problems, um, in which case you would have to consider, or the original uh, developers would have to consider whether they want to switch version control systems. If you're working with someone in particular, um, and that person uh, or people are very used to a particular uh, tool, then perhaps it's not worth trying to change the way they work. If they're comfortable with, with that and they're happy, just, just use whatever they use. You should try to experiment. Um, so you've seen that these distributed version control tools really offer you a lot. I mean, I would say that having the ability to commit locally is massive. Uh, it's a kind of game changer. It makes, it, it makes committing from this really kind of um, um, special thing into something that could become, become, become very routine. So Git and Mercurial will allow you to immediately start doing so. And they're fast and powerful. You really notice it. I mean, it's um, so, so yes, these systems are, 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 really, are really powerful. Uh, not only are they fast, but they're also powerful in the sense that um, they offer you very sophisticated uh, ways of uh, analyzing um, um, the revision history. So you can, for example, track using Git, you can track exactly over the course of, of, of a long development history of a project. You can track exactly uh, where a particular function, for example, uh, started out life, in which file, and if it moved files, and then how it, how it changed and developed. You can also um, um, for example, if you if you are testing your code, which you should try and do, and if you um, have what's called a continuous integration server or continuous integration setup, which is where you um, you commit code, and then after committing it or before committing it, you run it through this um, a standardized testing setup, and if the test fails, um, you can and if it throws up a bug. Um, you can uh, look at the um, at the uh, development history in a very precise way to try and track down where this bug was first introduced. So Git is especially powerful, but um, there is a lot of there is a lot of syntax um, that uh, can take getting used to. Um, so it is somewhat easier to get lost in, in using Git than with Mercurial starting out. So it offers you a lot of uh, somebody has put a lot of rope to hang yourself with. So, <laughs> but it's a, it's a very powerful tool, so I can I can absolutely recommend that that you try it. Okay. So um, that is essentially all I, I wanted to say. Um, there are some references. Um, the first one is uh, quite a good book as an introduction to um, Git in particular, but actually distributed version control in general. There's the um, subversion um, reference documentation, which doesn't just uh, have syntax, but also just recommendations about, about or examples about workflow, if you're wondering how you can do things. Um, GitHub has uh, a lot of information. Um, you can create an account, get started. Um, um, there's, there, there's really a lot of information available. So yeah, so this presentation was really to try to, um, to discuss uh, some of the most important differences. So the first presentation was about um, the introduction, general introduction to version control, uh, some of the commonalities between different version control systems, common concepts, common jargon. Um, but it really comes, uh, well, and this presentation was about the, the, the most important differences. Um, but it comes down to the nitty gritty of actually using um, Git, for example, or, or SVN or CBS. Um, there is, okay, you will have to get used to the way that, that these tools differ slightly. Um, so there's a, that's the, the practical um, 
on the website will give you some uh, on the actual website will give you some idea of how to use, how to start using subversion. So, um, if anybody does, anybody have any questions? So these slides um, that I just presented will become available on the Archer website um, quite shortly after this tutorial. And um, if you do have any questions or um, or either about about this presentation or about the previous presentation or about um, the uh, descriptive practical. Um, you can email either myself directly, so my email address, just give me in the chat, um, or you can email the Archer Help Desk. Any questions? So this the video recording of this session, um, at least from when I remember to press the record button, should become available in the next few days, depending on how long it takes us to, to extract it. From, um, from the system. So, any, and if there are no questions, um, you feel free to maybe make suggestions if, you, if there's anything you want to see um, in future, either related to this topic um, or any other topics uh, or virtual tutorials. Um, please feel free to email the, the, the help desk uh, with suggestions. Um, okay. Right. Okay, so oh there's um I think there might be a feedback. Um yes. I think there might be a feedback um request here at the beginning. Um so if you go to the um feedback section of the website you'll find the form. So under the training menu. Um, if you can fill it in, we very much appreciate it. Um, okay, so thank you for attending this virtual tutorial. Um, okay. Bye.